you pretty much just spit into this tube and it fills up so slowly. <laughs> It takes maybe like two or three minutes tops and then you put it in a container and you get re your results in like 12 hours. The University of Illinois is trying to control the spread of COVID-19 by collecting spit. Illinois' testing is, is, I mean, that has been one of the major innovations of our time. And as far as large public universities have gone, flagship universities have gone, Illinois has been able to keep its case count lower than a lot of places that we would expect uh, it to sort of follow, like the University of Georgia or the University of Texas, that kind of thing. The U of I implemented a mandatory screening program that tests students for the coronavirus two or three times a week. It's one of the largest programs in the country using a saliva-based test created in-house and one of the only mandating frequent testing. And that's fairly, fairly uncommon amongst universities. Um, most universities are opting for um, only symptomatic testing, so testing students when um, they start to ex exhibit symptoms. That's a massive issue because of how we know this virus spreads. Most people in that age group, in the 18 to 25 year old age group, who get COVID-19 will be asymptomatic. So if you're testing only symptomatic people, you're not gonna catch the disease as it spreads. The U of I built an entire system for testing campus goers, centered around a coronavirus test that samples the amount of virus in saliva. Students need proof of recent negative test results to gain access to campus buildings. Is this granted? And uh, that means I've had a recent negative test. So for the undergrads, if you haven't had a negative test in three days, it says denied and they can't get into a building. If students do test positive, they get a push notification on the app and are put into isolation, either in an isolation dorm or a hotel room. We have had students with symptoms, but we have not had a student hospitalized. And of course, that, that means that there have been no student deaths. While the testing is central to the university's strategy, building a new culture on campus has been a large part of the effort to control the spread of the virus. Socialization and culture are really important when it comes to this virus. Culturally, it's it's hard for students to buy into to testing when they know they have to go get 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 their brain picked every every week or so. They simply plan earlier and, and better than I would say everyone else. In April, researchers started developing a test that didn't require the supplies needed for a nasal test. Things like swabs and solutions that were hard to find earlier this year due to a national shortage. If you heat the saliva at 95 degrees uh, C for 30 minutes, it does a few really, really important things. One is that it inactivates the virus. Uh, secondly, it uh, uh, enables the genetic material to be accessible. And uh, thirdly, it inactivates the components in saliva that are inhibitory to PCR. PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, is a method researchers use to detect the coronavirus by amplifying and looking for the virus's genetic material, RNA. Scientists found that heating up the samples prepares it for the PCR process without all of the reagents needed for the nasal swab. With the addition of one buffer, the sample is ready for PCR. So we don't need a swab, we don't need the uh, viral transport medium, and we don't need the RNA isolation kit. All of those are gone, and so we don't have any of those supply chain bottlenecks. That's also why our test is so cheap, because we don't have to pay for any of those things. So, uh, and also why it's so fast. The test also gives information about viral load or how much of the virus is in a sample. That information, coupled with a record of recent tests, can be key in identifying how long someone has been infected. We actually get a quantitative readout of how many copies of the virus per milliliter of your saliva. And so we've been using that CT value, it's called the, the cycle threshold, uh, which is a direct readout of the concentration of the virus to help make decisions. If you've got 15 negatives in a row and now all of a sudden they just flip positive, that means you caught them on the way up. So it's context dependent. Testing everyone who comes on campus multiple times a week is no small undertaking. Their labs run around the clock, often processing more than 10,000 samples a day. One in 50 COVID-19 tests in America happens at the University of Illinois every day. I want to be very clear here, not one in 50 tests on college campuses in America, one in 50 tests in America happens at the University of Illinois. 
While the testing has been key to controlling the spread of the virus, it hasn't stopped the spread. When students returned to campus for the fall term, there were two big spikes in cases. One, researchers predicted. The other, an unwelcome surprise. So we modeled that uh, seven to 8,000 students would go to parties two or three times per week, and we modeled that they might not wear their masks all the time at their parties. So we knew this was gonna be a challenge, and we still predicted we'd be in really good shape. What we didn't model, however, was that students who knew they were positive would still go to a party, or if they knew they were positive, they would host a party in their house. Um, and that's what got us, that's what surprised us. County contact tracers have found that most cases in undergrads stem from either social gatherings or from where they live. There is no evidence of infection in class. There's no clusters by class group. And university researchers don't think that infections among the student population are spreading to faculty and staff or to the community around campus. The student group tends to infect amongst themselves. And then the faculty and staff, what we see is infections acquired in the community. Now, as cases rise across the U.S., researchers are noticing an uptick on campus too, adding to growing concern about the holidays. Having everybody leave and then come back is one of the biggest challenges. Chances are it's gonna be a, a very challenging event. It's almost like what we saw when they all came back the first time. You know, they bring back a lot of cases with them. So our hope was that they would, a lot of them would just choose to stay home. That said, we've been doing lots of surveys and it turns out a lot of them are coming back. I think we all have to recognize we're in for a really tough next three months or so. The new normal is we have to rethink how we socialize. We've got to do it differently.